welcome folks to the assembly room here at Hearst San Simeon State Historic Monument, better known as Hearst Castle. My name is Ryan and I'll be giving you a little look at the collection here today. There's a whole lot of things that we can talk about in a collection like this. Uh, the assembly room is filled with art objects that Hearst collected over the years. And honestly, you could spend entire days here at the castle and still not run out of things to talk about. The problem is, though, when there's so much to talk about, it's easy to miss out on some of the details. And even some of the important stuff can easily be overlooked. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Because there's one rather important sculpture that no one ever asks me about. The sculpture I wanted to show you is this one right here. And there's good reason for me to want to talk about this, and it goes beyond this sculpture's looks, because there's a story here. And the story, if told properly, involves the most powerful man in Europe, probably the greatest sculptor of an age, a statue that is stolen, and another that was thought missing. This is Antonio Canova's Venus of Tau. Now, to begin with, in 1796, Napoleon Bonaparte invades northern Italy. He, would get, he was still a general at the time, but would go on to lead France and conquer much of Europe. But this time, he was leading a division to try and oust Austrian forces from northern Italy. And while that is the intention of his campaign, he decided to take advantage of the situation for his own benefit as well. You see, uh, Napoleon had taken an interest in a particular sculpture in the collection of the Uffizi Gallery, the Medici Venus, an ancient Roman statue. And as he had the army to back him, he just took it. Took it with him back to Paris and left the Uffizi without one of its most important objects. Now, obviously the Uffizi wants to do something about it. And what they'll end up deciding on is that they need to hire someone to make a reproduction. The person they choose for that is a man by the name of Antonio Canova. He's the obvious choice, probably the most influential sculptor of his era. Few could compete with him. And a man who even popes and other leaders, and even Napoleon himself in later years, would commission to do work for him. So there's a good reason to choose him, but there is one problem. Canova doesn't do copies. And so when he takes this commission, he tells them, I'll do something similar, but you have to let me give it my own touch. Now, Canova will eventually be able to create the Ephesia sculpture for uh, their gallery, and they will receive it, but that's not where his work ends. See, if you're this famous, you're probably going to end up getting other commissions, and for something as high profile as this, other collectors are going to want versions of your sculpture. So Canova does three more. And this one in particular is purchased by a rather interesting individual by the name of Lucien Bonaparte. If the name sounds familiar, well, Lucien Bonaparte happens to be half-brother to Napoleon Bonaparte, which makes this a rather comedic purchase as the sculpture was only bought because Napoleon stole the original one. <laughs> Uh, whatever the case, though, he is able to purchase this, but Lucien doesn't hold on to it forever. Uh, later on, a few years later, it ends up in the Lansdowne collection. And while they will hold on to it for many years, by 1930, it will be sold off again, this time to a gentleman by the name of Mark or George Wilson. Mr. Wilson is not particularly famous. Uh, if you were an art historian, you probably wouldn't know his name. So from that perspective, from the perspective of most art historians, this sculpture vanishes. You see, George Wilson wasn't a famous collector. He's not someone that any art specialist could pick out of the crowd. So when he makes this purchase in the in 1930s, it sort of means that this sculpture just ends up in a private collection that no one knows where it is. So what you end up with is Art historians, even, even into the 1970s, saying that this sculpture is missing. But I'm standing next to it. 
It's not missing. And actually, it wasn't missing. As of night, it, as it happens, this sculpture wasn't purchased for George Wilson. It was purchased by George Wilson. You see, he happened to be father-in-law to William Randolph Hearst. Mr. Hearst purchases on such a scale that he oftentimes couldn't go in person to purchase the art he wanted. So you have someone else purchase it for you and then send it back here to your home. And what this leads to is, well, art historians don't know where it is, but it's sitting right here in Hearst's living room. In fact, more to the point, by 1958, the state of California takes over this estate and we are regularly giving tours of the place. We would have almost a million people coming through here a year in some of the early years. But it still isn't identified until almost the 70s, at least by outside dealers. Now, we here at the castle were aware of what it was, but the truth is it's easy to overlook stuff like this if you aren't looking for it specifically. And you remember what I said earlier. No one ever asks me about it, even now. But, well, it wasn't missing. It was just in Mr. Hurst's living room. 